Uh, welcome. Thank you for joining us this morning. Uh, my name is Louis Gutierrez. I am the administrator for the retirees and the Emeriti Faculty Associations. Uh, just a few housekeeping rules. We will take questions at the end of the event or at the end of the conversation. And uh, if you could put those in the Q&A, that would be great. And then we will uh, we'll ask those. If you have questions during the event, please put them in the Q&A and we will get to as many as we can um, at the end. I'm going to introduce uh, Dorla Cantu, who is our um, uh, planner for events uh, programming. Sorry about that, Dorla. <laughs> Take it away. It's okay. All right. Thanks, Lewis. Thank you again for joining us. We this is our uh, one of our continuing uh, programs with uh, that we do jointly with uh, UC Berkeley, and uh, so welcome to you all. Today we have uh, Dr. Elisa Chavez who earned her dental degree at, here at UCSF. And uh, she also has a, a certificate, I believe it's called in geriatric dentistry from the University of Michigan. Over much of her career, including 16 years at the University of the Pacific School of Dentistry, she's been dedicated to improving access to care for geriatric patients. In 2001, Dr. Chavez developed the pre and postdoc clinical education programs for the School of Dentistry at Unlocked Lifeways, a nonprofit organization that pursues quality of life and care for older adults and their families. She continues to serve as director of programs and is a staff dentist at Unlock, overseeing student rotations for medically complex geriatric patients. So let's welcome Dr. Chavez. Good morning. Thank you so much for having me. I'm really pleased to be here um, talking about oral health and particularly um, oral health as it relates to successful aging. So I'm gonna share a screen here. Uh, okay. Looks great. Great, thank you. All right. So these are the things that we'll talk about today. I'll just uh, tell you a little bit um, about myself and my practice so you have some perspective uh, about where I'm coming from um, as we have discussion today. Talk a little bit about the scope and the need of oral health care for older adults. Um, and it's varied if we're thinking about well elders um, to the full spectrum of people who may be frail and medically compromised. We'll talk about age related and age prevalent oral diseases. Um, what's the difference and um, how do we think about those in terms of risk and management and thinking about the risks to our oral health over a lifetime, because there may be some that uh, we haven't really considered before. And we'll talk about systemic diseases and the delivery of oral health care as we discuss that risk as well. So just to give you some background, um, I've, I've been very privileged, as was mentioned in the introduction, uh, to teach at University of Pacific Dagoni School of Dentistry. And within that to also teach at Unlock Lifeways, which is a PACE program, a program of all-inclusive care for elders. And they're essentially a nursing home population. The goal of the program is to keep people who are nursing home eligible living in the community for as long as possible um, by providing interprofessional care. So they really provide comprehensive care. Um, I've been fortunate to be a part of that interdisciplinary team and to have the opportunity for our students to experience that and to learn from that as well. So um, I'm, I'm always grateful uh, that I've had the opportunity to practice, you know, within the scope of patients um, that's interesting to me and with some very um, wonderful partners there. I'll mention a few products. I typically don't mention too many, um, you know, for the most part, unless it's something I'm prescribing, I think, you know, people wanna use what they like um, and I encourage that if it's helpful for them. Um, so I don't have any conflicts of interest in anything that I might mention today, no financial interest in any of them. And then, you know, this is a big topic, so we're covering a few things. I know we have a really diverse group this morning, which is um, great. So trying to find a balance and, you know, hopefully it will be the right one of uh, enough information, but not too much. I tried to keep the clinical pictures a little bit to a minimum. I have a few of them in there. Um, but <laughs> just to give you enough information without being too, um, too dental, <laughs> especially this hour of the morning. 
I like to start my presentations with my conclusions. So we know sometimes um, internet connections are unstable. Who knows you know, what might happen? You might get called away. So I'm gonna start off where I'd like to end up. And that is to focus on the idea that declining oral health is not a consequence of normal aging. So we should expect um, to keep our dentition and our mouths healthy over the course of our lifetime. And age in and of itself is not a contraindication to oral health care. So just because you're 80 or 90 or 100 um, doesn't mean that you know, healthcare, oral health care is not needed anymore. We know that systemic diseases can present a challenge to maintaining good oral health um, and sometimes to providing oral health care, but that shouldn't stop us. And one of the, the ways that we can continue to provide care even to patients who have the most complex health issues is to really embrace that interdisciplinary aspect and to you know, engage with other professions as a provider and as a patient to make sure that those who care for us are connected and you know, that we've given them the opportunity to talk to each other so that we get the best outcomes. And I always like to think about the reality of a patient situation, um, realities, um, risks, opportunities can change as we know over a lifetime. So we might have, you know, a particular period in our life where oral health care may kind of fall at the back burner, but at some point, you know, we want to make sure that that's addressed. So being sure that we're realistic about um, whatever place we're at as a patient, or if we're a provider, whatever place the patient's at and thinking about what's realistic for them at this point. What do we hope, to, what do they want to achieve and what can we realistically plan? So of course we have to have a demographic slide. I think we all uh, understand that the population is aging. Um, you can see there about 20% of Americans by 2030 will be over age 65. And the fastest growing group is actually those who are 85 and older. And um, of those, there are some who live in institutional settings and they're there because they require help on a 24 seven basis with basic activities of life, right? Um, taking care of themselves, overall managing complex uh, medical conditions, managing their medications, uh, sometimes hygiene, taking care of themselves. So, you know, when we're talking about older adults, it's a very diverse group as we know. So we have well elders, all the way to frail elders. So, um, you know, people, we might think of kids at certain developmental stages and kind of have an idea what to expect, but for older adults, it's really broad. And it also depends on what access they've had to care over their lifetime. And that can be very different. When we think about the need in California specifically, the Center for Oral Health did a, a study in 2018, and they found that 46% of older adults who live independently in the community had untreated oral disease. And that went up quite a bit for people who were in skilled nursing. And for the reasons we just discussed, you know, increased dependency, um, more complex medical conditions, um, people who are in the institutions have a higher burden of oral disease than people who are living more independently. However, um, there are people living in the community who may also face challenges in care. So, um, you know, they may not know how to get health care. Um, they may not know that it's important. They may have financial issues. They may be coping with a change in their health status um, that can present some challenges to them as well. So it's important to be thinking about that um, and making sure that people have those opportunities to seek care and know that it's important to do that. So I've broken up this slide. It, this is a big, long, busy slide, and I've broken it up into a couple sections when we think about oral diseases. And we're gonna, we'll start there. We'll talk about what are the oral diseases that we're concerned about as people get older. And, you know, how do we get them? So we're thinking about, you know, what is the oral environment like? And that may change depending on your health, uh, depending on the ability to um, provide your provide oral hygiene, um, access you have to a dentist to have regular care, 
Um, behaviors we know fall into that. So habits, maybe habits, you know, are difficult to change that may have existed over a lifetime. Um, or it may be that habits changed based on other health circumstances that have changed. And of course, we have pathogens. So you add time to that. And when we think of age prevalent diseases, these are diseases that occur more commonly as people get older, but not because of aging in and of itself. And that's an important distinction. We think about the same things we think about at any age. So we think about cavities, gum disease, uh, diseases of the nerves of the teeth, oral cancer, other oral pathology, um, like intraoral fungal infections, that kind of thing. And when we think about these age prevalent diseases, the risks um, and the diseases themselves are exacerbated by some things we may not be thinking of. So this idea of limited health literacy, people may not have had access to um, a lot of oral health care when they were children. Um, maybe they've lost access to oral health care or they kind of thought, well, maybe it's not as important as I get older. People may not realize the impact that systemic diseases can have on oral health directly as well as indirectly. There are many medications that can impact um, oral health and increase risk for specific oral diseases. And sometimes we have provider limitations as well. So sometimes providers, uh, dentists themselves are not quite comfortable caring for patients who have more complex medical um, conditions. And we have to think about the settings that are appropriate. Um, part of this idea of, you know, is oral health really important is as we get older um, is an issue of ageism and kind of what people expected in past generations, which I think is, is changing greatly. Um, but people may think, you know, well, it's normal to get these oral diseases as you get older. It's normal to lose your teeth and that's not really the case. So we have to change that conversation um, around oral health. If people have some kind of disease that impairs their ability to take care of themselves in terms of their oral health to go seek care, whether it's from a physical issue or a cognitive issue, that, that's gonna increase the risk. We think about age-related conditions and impairments. So things that occur with normal aging, we may have some changes in vision, some changes in hearing um, that impact our ability to, to access care, to follow instructions, to get information, to assess our own oral health. And if those um, things are getting in the way of our ability to do those things, that can compromise our oral health. And of course, we think about limited financial resources, which is a reality for many older adults. Uh, many older adults, if they had uh, dental insurance through their, their work, many people lose that insurance on retirement. So they, they rely on out-of-pocket to either buy insurance or pay for their needs as they come up. So... If we have these oral diseases that are not being treated, we're at risk for both acute and ongoing chronic infections um, that can lead to tooth loss and sometimes more serious situations. And we think about all the ways that oral health impacts the rest of our lives, the rest of our health. So, you know, at a minimum, if you think about having untreated cavities, untreated periodontal disease, that may change your, the way food tastes to you. Um, it will certainly change the way you are able to chew and enjoy your food. And you may change your food choices because you're having difficulty chewing, maybe pain due to caught or cold, or you can feel the teeth moving. And so now you're changing your diet, you know, and these may be very subtle changes. Like if you, um, you know, maybe you're getting, getting some arthritis and maybe instead of taking the stairs, you start taking the elevator Well, that's a little bit less activity. And so for your, your nutritional intake, it can be very subtle, but suddenly now you're not quite getting the same nutrition you were because you're making changes, trying to accommodate what's happened in your mouth and diminished quality of life. So, you know, sometimes it's not, not fun to change to a diet that's uh, maybe less varied, maybe a softer diet overall. We have the, if we have untreated diseases, then we have this risk of having chronic inflammation. And we know there's lots of association with chronic inflammation and other systemic diseases, heart diseases, um, cerebrovascular disease, um, diabetes. 
So we think about that interaction as a two-way interaction, right? Poor oral health having an impact and associations with common chronic systemic diseases, as well as the, the other way around, as I've discussed, the potential for those diseases, the medications that are used to treat them to have an impact on the oral health. And of course, having chronic and acute pain and discomfort. Um, and one thing we need to think about, particularly for older adults who may be more cognitively impaired, um, they may not really be able to express that discomfort. And so that's a, that's a significant concern. Um, you know, you yourselves may be very well and, and able to express when you have a problem or identify a problem, um, but there are people who are not so able and they rely on others to notice a change in eating habits, a change in behavior, um, a resistance to brushing an area of their mouth, those kinds of things. And certainly if your oral health is declining and you have some sort of embarrassment or difficulty, maybe you used to like to eat out with others and now you, know, you can't really eat and enjoy your food the same way, that can result in social isolation. And certainly things become more expensive and more challenging to treat if we're, we get to the point where we have an acute condition or we have something that's been chronic and progressing for a long period of time. So that's kind of a big, a big overview. Um, we'll come back and visit some of those concepts um, in a little bit more detail. All right, so I said I try to keep the more graphic clinical slides to a minimum, and this is not um, too alarming. I, I hope, again, I realize we have a, a wide range of, of, of people participating this morning. So this is not uncommon to something as, you know, something that I would see, somebody who's lost some teeth over time. You can see um, uh, plaque forming around the teeth some cavities um, in there. And this person has broken a, a tooth off here. So there's a root tip in there. And you can see this has been this way for some time. They haven't had an opportunity to replace many, the missing teeth because those spaces have closed in. All right. So when I think about the patients that I'm treating, even though you know we say geriatrics and we're thinking about people as they get older, um, I try not to think about it in terms of an age so much and really think about it as an issue of health versus disease. So we may have you know, older adults that we're seeing who are well elders, who have some of those normal age-related changes we talked about, changes in vision, some changes in hearing. Um, they may have some chronic diseases that are well-managed. Um, that are not age related, but overall, you know, they're doing pretty well. But we may also have patients at the other end of the spectrum who have a disease um, like Parkinson's disease in this case, um, that is something that's going to be progressive. And so we have to think about that progression and how that's gonna impact their ability to care for their teeth and our ability to care for them uh, on the other side of that as the dentist. So here's our list of age prevalent oral diseases. So again, these are diseases that are not a result of aging in and of itself, um, but things that we might see more commonly as people get older. And sometimes people think, well, caries are for kids, um, but that's not necessarily the case. And older adults tend to be at higher risk for what we call root caries. And so if you think of that as, um, areas of the, the teeth where the roots become exposed um, from recession or gum disease where they've lost bone, those surfaces are much more, uh, they're, they're less resistant uh, to caries because the surfaces are softer. And so when you look in this mouth also, you can see we're thinking about, you know, what's happening in this mouth that's putting this person at risk for, for root caries. Um, other kinds of caries as well, but again, root caries is what we most commonly think of um, for older adults. But if you look, this is someone who hasn't had the benefit of orthodontia in their lifetime. And so they're dealing with some teeth that are crowded and not in an ideal position, which makes it very difficult to clean. They have those areas of recession again, which is kind of a requirement for root caries. Um, changes in saliva, if there's less saliva uh, due to medication then that's gonna increase the risk for caries. And thinking about the overall environment now, so we have an area that's difficult to clean, um, the mouth is dry, and so we're getting 
a buildup of, of plaque around that the person's having difficulty cleaning off. No matter how well you clean your teeth, that plaque is gonna harden into what we call calculus. Um, you might hear them refer to tartar on television. And that has to be removed um, by, by hygienist or dentist. So no matter how, how well you clean your teeth, you still need that professional care as well. We think of restorations that uh, may be failing, maybe margins are opening or they may break um, for some reason. Um, we may have partial dentures that are in place, maybe a clasp um, that's you know, trapping some plaque or calculus in there, creating a, a risk for a cavity in that area. So we think about the intraoral environment um, and just another image here, you can see um, this patient has had some bone loss. There's more of the two surfaces. They've had some of those filled. They're getting some recurrent cavities as well. So just because a tooth has been filled, you can still be at risk to have recurrent cavities around those restorations as well. So in addition to those intraoral risk factors, we think about, well, what's happening in terms of the whole person as well that's increasing that risk. So disability. So someone who is maybe dependent on someone else uh, to help them clean their mouth. And again, um, I recognize that um, this is more likely a, a, well, a well elder um, group. Um, the patients I care for do very often require someone else uh, to help them with keeping their mouth clean, but they also require help getting to and from the dentist. So if that's a challenge, uh, for whatever reason, whether you know you've stopped driving for some reason, uh, maybe you never drove, but it's hard to negotiate public transportation if you have uh, severe arthritis, something like that, um, that becomes an issue, something that has to be considered that was different than before. Again, that knowledge, um, people sometimes thinking that cavities are for kids or that's not as important to maintain your oral health as you get older, so changing that conversation resources as we discussed. So that would be part of that extra oral risk. If you don't have the resources to have those regular cleanings um, to not only clean your teeth, um, but also to identify diseases at an early stage, that can be a problem. And sometimes motivation is an issue. So, you know, people may uh, become socially isolated for one reason or another. Um, maybe they have had the loss of a spouse, a sibling, they may, you know, have some period of depression um, where they may not be as motivated to care for their teeth as they once were. And so thinking about those things, and those can be temporary, they can be longer lasting, but being aware of those and, and trying to address that um, are important aspects of preventing caries as well as other oral diseases. And this is just x-rays to show you um, you know, what we see, well, you can see root caries in the mouth, but you also see them in the x-ray. Typically, they tend to be, they start out anyway, um, somewhat shallow, so they don't, you can restore them oftentimes without getting near the nerve. But as you can see in this tooth, this has had a root canal in the past and the root caries have gone right through the, that root of the tooth. So that won't be restorable. There are some, um, things we can think about in terms of prevention and minimally invasive treatment. And so these are important for patients who may have more advanced disease or may be in a situation where their health conditions are not quite stable, and, but we wanna stabilize them from an oral health perspective until they get that um, the under better control. And then we can come back and provide definitive care. So one of the things we do is a caries risk assessment. So thinking about what is that balance that, that's going on in the oral cavity. You know, what things can we address? Is the environment acidic? Um, is it dry? Um, does the oral hygiene need improvement? How can we help the person address this? So addressing what exactly are the risks to this, to this patient in terms of caries and what will we do? Sometimes we may see uh, large caries um, that we might want or even small caries that we might want to just put an interim restoration in. And again, the purpose of that is to provide some stabilization of the oral health to slow down the process so that while other factors are getting, you know, under control in terms of health, um, or is, you know, sometimes just the patient's ability to come back and, and have a definitive restoration, they may show up with a lot of cavities 
and we want to do some sort of interim restoration until they're able to come back and have that care. And we also have something called silver diamine fluoride in addition to other kinds of fluorides that we have that are over the counter. There's some prescription pastes and gels and rinses. Um, there are things that we can apply in the office. So one is a fluoride varnish, but the silver diamine fluoride can be used for tooth sensitivity, which is one, but it can also be used to, in many cases, arrest caries, active cavities uh, that are in the mouth. And so that's great if we're thinking about you know, stabilizing a situation so that we can come back and provide definitive care later. Or if we are managing somebody who has very significant systemic uh, issues where we can't provide that care and we're trying to, um, to keep them as stable as we can without having some sort of acute event. So if we have cavities that are progressing, or maybe we've had some kind of trauma to the tooth, we can get an infection in the nerve and that would be another cause of tooth loss. So when we think about infection in the nerves of the teeth, we're thinking about a root canal or to have the teeth taken out. So this tooth has a lot of problems. <laughs> we've lost a lot of bone here, um, but it does have a nice uh, halo. So you can see the bone loss around these teeth, um, which you which you will often see when you've had uh, the death of the nerve like that. One of the things about older adults is they have what's called atypical response to disease. And what that means is that they may not come up at, with a specific complaint like you or I would um, saying, well, this hurts when I eat something sweet or this hurts when I have uh, something cold. It may be that they don't have that presentation for a number of reasons. And so a problem won't be identified until it's an acute stage where there's really a lot of pain. And there are a few reasons for that. So there are some changes in the nerves of the teeth. Um, they get smaller, the, um, the canals get much more narrow. Oops, didn't mean to forward. Um, so if you have a younger, a younger tooth, the canals of the teeth would be much more visible here. Um, and so when you think about that, that tissue shrinking, there's a less response. If you have um, a cognitive issue, maybe you know somebody who's had a stroke and doesn't have sensation in an area of their mouth, they are not, are not gonna be able to say, oh, it hurts here, it hurts there. So just keeping in mind that the presentation may be different um, compared to a younger person. So that can make diagnosis a little bit challenging. Um, treatment. So general dentists provide um, root canals, but sometimes they will also refer to specialists. So part of that embracing a team approach is not only so that, you know, different kinds of healthcare providers communicate with one another, um, but also that, you know, in dentistry, we're making full use of the specialists that we have. And I, I fully embrace <laughs> referring patients to endodontists for root canals when that need um, arises. So again, ideally we wanna prevent that, right? So treating that cavity early on before allowing it to progress to a stage where a root canal um, becomes the option or an extraction. And that may sound, um, you know, yes, we, we would do that, um, but probably you would be surprised to hear the number of times I have older adults who may say, well, it's a cavity and I don't really feel it. And until it bothers me, I'm not going to do anything. So I really try to try to encourage them to let's take care of this at an early stage. Even if you're not having pain, that doesn't mean that there's not a problem. So periodontal disease would be the next kind of the next disease that we think about um, for age prevalent oral diseases. Um, risk factors are, are very much the same as for caries. So the increased plaque, more pathogens around. If we've had teeth that have been lost previously and not um, put something there to maintain the space, not replace the teeth that we're missing as we saw in that other picture, the teeth can drift around, they can tilt, they can move into other spaces. And that exposes areas of the teeth um, that can be more difficult to clean as well as just creating <clears throat> an area that's more difficult to clean. And also if you have restorations that have broken, maybe uh, getting recurrent caries underneath 
those all create areas where plaque um, and calculus can build up in increasing the risk for periodontal diseases. Decreased chewing ability. Um, again, that goes to the point of you know, maybe making some changes in your diet, opting for softer foods, things that might uh, hang around the teeth that are more difficult to clean, all, that will also increase your risk for caries. And coming back around to those extra oral risk factors. So education, people understanding what are the general causes of periodontal disease, as well as their specific risks. What do we see in their mouth? What do we see um, externally, if we think about somebody who has arthritis, again, as an example that, you know, maybe they used to floss before, and now they're not able to do that anymore. So how can we help them? Maybe um, a, a floss holder, um, something that they can use instead of uh, regular floss, but that will still allow them to continue to floss. Again, the issue of finances. Um, for a number of reasons, if you have a situation where you're not able to clean your teeth as well as you were before, you may need to have your teeth clean more often. Uh, so that means maybe three times, maybe four times a year, um, maybe having fluoride at those visits if your caries risk is high. And so again, that ability or inability uh, to pay can create a risk for the disease starting and continuing. And some systemic health. So spe um, specifically, we think about patients with poorly controlled diabetes. Patients with well-controlled diabetes um, may not have additional risk for periodontal disease based on the disease itself. But if they're not well-controlled, there is um, an increased risk of advancing periodontal disease. So if we've had caries that have advanced that we weren't able to restore, periodontal disease has reached the point where we've had to take teeth out. The next age prevalent uh, disease that we'd be thinking about is edentulism. It could be partial, it could be complete, and there are different ways to restore dentition uh, once you've lost it. So one might be filling the space with a removable partial denture that's shown here, something that would come in and out of your mouth. Um, if it's more limited loss, you might replace it with a fixed bridge, something that would, you'd use two teeth around a space to create a bridge there and cement those on. And of course, implants might be used um, in certain cases. And so again, the decision about this isn't really about what age someone is. Oh, if you're 70, this is appropriate. If you're 80, this is appropriate it really comes back to that issue of health and disease and what is the person able to tolerate um, in terms of care, what makes sense. Um, if they have health conditions that are not well controlled, then something that's more invasive like an implant, a fixed bridge may not be an option. Um, if they're very well controlled, you may have a, a broader range of options. And certainly if you're you know, a well elder, um, the, the options would be greater again. So really thinking on an individual basis, thinking about the issues of systemic health, oral health, those intraoral factors, the extraoral factors, really what's coming at play here. Um, how is this person gonna tolerate the treatment? And then how will they benefit and be able to maintain? So that's the other thing we wanna think about on the, other, on the other side. Can they continue to floss? Flossing underneath a bridge, cleaning around an implant. Um, does it make sense to have something that um, is removed every, every night, um, brushed well, and then placed in the morning like a removable prosthesis? There are some oral uh, pathology that we also see more commonly as people age. So there are some age-related changes that happen in the oral cavity. And one of those are changes in the mucosa. So much as we think about um, skin getting thinner, a bit more fragile, as people get older, the same thing happens with the oral mucosa. So that's a case where it's really important that any partial dentures, dent dentures fit well so that you diminish that risk of um, trauma from those. And 
that can also be exacerbated by having a dry mouth. So certainly if the mouth is dry, the tissues are more fragile, may be more prone to some kind of trauma in the mouth. So denture sores would be one. Um, when you look at these images, lost my pointer, you know, this one may look the most alarming perhaps, right? Because it's large. Um, this is actually a benign lesion. That's something we call epulis. And this is from an ill-fitting denture. So a denture moving around. So sometimes people will think, well, if someone doesn't have teeth and they have a denture, well, they're fine. We just don't need to have an exam anymore unless there's a problem. So this may not be something that the patient necessarily notices. They may kind of notice my denture doesn't really fit the same, but they make accommodations and they kind of get used to it. Um, so that's one reason because you wanna catch these things early before you have to have surgery to resolve it and then make a new denture. But also for reasons like this. So you can see this lesion here, um, almost not noticeable. This was a squamous cell carcinoma, so oral cancer. So whether you have teeth or you don't have teeth, having a regular annual, annual visit is very important. Um, again, identifying any kind of pathology early on, but particularly oral cancers. Um, this lesion down here looks like kind of cracked dry lips. This is actually a fungal infection. And so that would require um, some ointment to be resolved. So again, just keeping in mind, um, whether it's for yourself or a loved one, um, friend, you know, that, that may be thinking they don't need a regular dental visit because they have a denture and they don't have any problems that they know of, um, good also to continue at least with those annual visits. Sometimes people have a dry mouth. Um, they have a sensation of dry mouth. They may or may not have actually diminished salivary flow. Um, and that's not a normal part of aging. Um, it's usually associated with some specific disease or medica uh, medication um, that has a side effect of diminished salivary flow. So that can increase, as we discussed, risk of root caries, increased fragility of the tissues, particularly as the mucosis getting thinner and a little bit more fragile. If it's very severe, people may have a hard time speaking. They may seem as if they're cognitively impaired. Um, usually that would happen in you know, somebody who's having some kind of chemotherapy, some kind of medication with a really um, significant reduction in salivary, salivary flow as a side effect. Um, difficulty swallowing. So again, that may affect food choices, um, things that they're gonna select to eat or not eat because they're having difficulty swallowing. They might not be able to eat at all unless they have a glass of water or something there. And certainly that's gonna alter the way food tastes. Um, you may have a sensation that you have a bad taste or um, bad breath. Someone may mention that you know, to you as, as something that's changed. Um, so, so those are also things that caregivers might notice. So those are changes that can occur when salivary flow is not as it should be. So we always wanna identify the cause. Is it related to a disease? Is it related to a medication? So there, there are many older adults who are taking many medications and there are lots of medications that can have this as a side effect. So sometimes it's hard to know you know, which medication is it? Could you switch it? Could you change it? Well, maybe, maybe not. So sometimes we have to deal with the situation we have. So having frequent sips of water during the day, um, sugarless candies to kind of uh, stimulate the salivary flow, but you want to make sure it's sugarless. There are salivary substitutes. Again, I don't have any um, financial interest in any of these. There are different kinds that you can find um, at the, at the drugstore. So as long as it's one you like, and you know, those you kind of use, you might use them maybe 10 minutes before meals or before bed, or when you first wake up, whenever you feel your mouth the driest. Salivary stimulants are a prescription, and those are usually used in specific cases, um, a disease called Sjogren's disease, or if you've had a history of head and neck radiation, um, you may have a prescription for that. So most often we're dealing with these things that are, you know, things that patient can, patients can easily do, um, for themselves to relieve that sense of dry mouth. But again, making sure that we're addressing the issues of, of sugar. We don't want that hanging around the teeth and creating a risk of cavities um, and then frequent water. So these are some of the medications that older adults may commonly be taking. 
um, that could cause dry mouth. So antihistamines, diuretics, antidepressants, and acids, if you have reflux, and chemo, some chemotherapeutics. So the, the list is huge. <laughs> there are literally hundreds of them. Um, and I, I think that's something to be aware of. And even if you have diminished salivary flow, you may not have the sensation of a dry mouth, which is interesting. So, you know, I wouldn't necessarily assume that, you know, everything's fine. Again, that's one of those reasons you want to have those regular dental visits, because that's something your dentist would be assessing on those regular visits. So prevention, um, again, we talked about, you know, it may be that someone who has more of these intra or extra risk factors for any of these diseases needs to see their dentist more than every six months. Um, how often they need to see them or the kind of preventive regimen they have at home or the kind of preventive products they have may change over time. Um, maybe they change in response to a particular um, event or you know, some specific health challenge that they're having. And then keeping, keeping in mind that atypical response to disease um, that we have as we get older. Things may not present in the same way that we would, would have anticipated them when we were younger. And so it may mean that we're not noticing something until it comes to be a more severe condition. Um, and good home care. I started that because that's really important. So the time you're in the dental office is very brief <laughs> compared to the time that you're at home. So trying to find a routine that works for you, thinking about, you know, if the dentist recommends a, a change in your routine and or change in products that you're using, thinking about, is this a permanent change? Maybe it's a temporary change. So thinking about that, um, finding routines that work well for you. So part of what I regard as prevention and preparation, um, and, and that I would like all patients to do, is to really review their health history with their dentist. I mean, they're gonna ask you to review your health history, mark off any boxes. And I would say, don't assume that something is or is not important. So if there's a new diagnosis that you've had or a loved one has had, um, make sure that the dentist is aware of that because those are things that we're gonna consider as those risk factors, right? Is the diabetes well-controlled? How severe is the arthritis? Is it inhibiting your ability to, to floss your teeth or to brush your teeth? What changes can we make for that? Um, if you have high blood pressure, is it well controlled? If we're going to provide a procedure in the office, we want to know that. If uh, you've been diagnosed with cancer, what's the plan? We may, you know, we'll need to coordinate your care perhaps um, around treatment that you're having and discuss any recent events, whether it was a hospitalization, um, trauma, anything like that. Again, important to discuss with your dentist so that we can help assess those risks. If we don't know, you know, we can't, we can't address that. And again, just don't assume that um, it's not important or that it wouldn't make a difference. Um, it can. And so, you know, you should feel free to have that discussion with your dentist and also telling them about any new medications, maybe something that you've recently been prescribed for chest pain or develop COPD and you need an inhaler now. Those are things we wanna know, we wanna make sure you have them when you come for your visits. There can be medications that in addition to the potential for changes in salivary flow, um, they can affect the, the gingiva as well. So calcium channel blockers are one. If your oral hygiene's not great, those may increase the risk for what we call gingival enlargement, um, creating an area that's more difficult to clean inflammation of the, the gums around the teeth. Any anticoagulants that you may be on, whether it's aspirin, um, something you know more significant, um, Coumadin, uh, if you're familiar with that. Um, those kinds of things we need to know about, again, assessing risk, not only for your oral health, but things we need to consider as we're providing care. So um, we wanna know that if you have diabetes and you've previously been managed, with uh, an oral medication, and now you have a prescription for insulin. Very important for us to know that. So make sure you're having those, those discussions. Keeping in mind again, that there are consequences of untreated oral diseases. So we wanna avoid acute infection. Um, if there are you know, teeth we can't restore anymore, um, the appearance can be altered, 
We certainly want to avoid any pain or discomfort. And as we mentioned, you know, it may just be discomfort enough that you're changing your diet, that you're changing your, your social interactions, right? Um, we want to think about that because that can have a significant impact. You know, we want to we want to make sure that we're maintaining, helping our patients maintain their quality of life. And we want to avoid things that are more complex to treat. It gets more expensive, more difficult um, as the patient, more difficult for the provider too, if I'm being honest, right? So when we think about these barriers to good oral health over a lifetime, um, for many people, it's been a lack of information, lack of information that they may have had over their lifetime, depending on what kind of access they had to to oral care beginning from being children, right? Um, I, and the aspect of ageism and thinking, well, it's normal to lose your teeth or it doesn't matter or as long as it doesn't hurt. Um, thinking about, again, the health status and people may not think of that so much. Um, what changes in my physical ability to take care of myself to get to and from the dental office? Those things can also be impacted by my cognitive ability. So I need to be thinking about that for myself or for others. And there are people who've been scared of the dentist their entire life. That's not going to change <laughs> now. So we may still have to deal you know, with issues of that. I've seen patients who have avoided care for 10, 20, 30 years. And so now we have a more complex situation. Um, and it could be an issue of habit. So sometimes habits are difficult to break. Sometimes people have an idea about a habit they should have. They say, well, I must brush my teeth at this time during the day. Well, if that doesn't fit your schedule, if there's a TV show you like to watch or a podcast you, you plan to listen to, you know, time your toothbrushing around that, make it something that fits with your lifestyle. It doesn't have to be according to, you know, some specific clock. You can use your clock. Um, thinking about the providers. So recognizing it's important for all the providers you have for providing care to have information um, about what's going on with the rest of your health care. Um, also recognizing that your providers may need to refer you to other providers. So you may have a general dentist who's providing your overall care, comes up with the plan. Also very appropriate um, for them to refer you to an oral surgeon, to an endodontist, to a periodontist, depending on your need. And they're kind of guiding you through, through the whole treatment plan until you get to a place where you're stable. And then recognizing the reality of finances. So um, that's an, another important discussion for patients to have with their providers. What's realistic in terms of what they can afford? Um, what's gonna achieve the goals um, to maintain function? and comfort and dignity. So we all really have to find the motivation. Um, unfortunately, what I see a lot is pain as a motivator. Some people really um, just feel like that's the ultimate motivator and they're gonna wait until they have some pain um, to go forward with care that I've recommended or to seek care to begin with. For some people, it may be embarrassment. They may be self-conscious about um, having missing teeth and they finally wanna go ahead and have those replaced. Um, maybe be a more social, um, interacting with family and friends. The aesthetics might be an issue, so it might not be such an issue of their missing teeth, but they'd really like their teeth to look nicer. And so they might be interested in seeing a dentist for that. Um, family and friends can also be um, really effective motivators. Uh, to seek care. So if they have someone encouraging them, someone to help them get to and from visits, someone to be there and listen, you know, maybe um, if you're not quite sure you're going to remember what was discussed, having a family or friend there um, to hear the conversation with you, um, to remind you of that later. Um, sometimes um, caregivers are the ones who may generate um, a request for a referral, a motivation. You know, we may have um, loved ones who have someone who's providing day-to-day -day care and, you know, there'll be important people um, in that team to provide information to us if there's something to be concerned about. Um, a referral. So it could be a referral from a physician. I mean, you know, in an ideal world, uh, I would love it if I, I had, you know, um, physicians who diagnose a patient with diabetes and they say, okay, you've been diagnosed with diabetes you should go see the dentist, tell them about this, have those conversations. Um, sometimes it's affordability. So finding a plan, is, as I mentioned before, that really meets your goals um, and restores function 
the aesthetics, you know, everything that, you, that you're after in an affordable way. And that can be a challenge. That, that's a reality. And hopefully part of the motivation, I put good health as a question mark, but hopefully to recognize the oral health, maintaining that is really such an important aspect of overall good health and successful aging. So I'm going to leave it where I started. Uh, so hopefully now uh, we've sort of solidified that thought that declining oral health is not a consequence of normal aging. Just because you're a certain age doesn't mean that uh, you shouldn't have dental care anymore. We know that systemic diseases can present a challenge to maintaining good oral health. So important to discuss those um, with, your, with your dentist so that they can take those into account. Um, embracing the idea that all your people who are caring for you need that information shared um, and sharing that with them, recognizing, you know, they'll, they'll make recommendations for referrals that are important. And again, getting to that idea of what's real. Um, the reality of a situation can change over time. You know, as we mentioned, there may be, you know, some situation where this is not an ideal time to have oral health care, but the time shouldn't be never, right? There has to also be a time um, in there to address the oral health needs and we can do it safely. Um, we can do it effectively if we're having those interprofessional um, conversations as well as conversations between the patient and the provider. I, I came across this a uh, long time ago and it's meant different things to me in, in my career. Um, I think, you know, geriatrics is kind of overlooked um, in many ways as, uh, as a professional endeavor. Um, I learn so much every day from my patients. Um, I, I always see something new that I have not seen before. So for me, um, that's really um, something that I've enjoyed over my career. But lately, this also means to me that if we've all done our job right, whether we're a patient, you know, we're all patients at, at some point, whether we're the patient, whether we're the provider, um, to have people reach older adulthood with good oral health and really just be, be doing preventive care, you know, making sure that that good health remains um, through the rest of their life so they can enjoy quality of life during that time. I think that's really the season of the harvest. So I, ha I have a little different view on this now. Um, this is a sort, you know, resources and references that I used in this presentation, some things that are maybe TMI, um, other things that might be of interest. And I'll leave it there. Thank you. Thank you, uh, Dr. Chavez, uh, for this uh, for providing this information. That uh, there is uh, quite a lot to consider here. Um, I do have some questions, and I would encourage anybody uh, with additional questions to um, to post in the Q and A. We would be happy to uh, answer as many as we can. Um, the first question is, uh, what, how, how would you define good home care? Okay, so when I'm thinking of home care, I'm thinking of, you know, mechanical removal of the plaque that's on your teeth on a daily basis. So brushing, flossing, um, and, you know, you could use a regular toothbrush, you could use an electric toothbrush, but it's really kind of your basic oral hygiene that you're providing for yourself or if you... Um, you know, have a loved one that maybe requires assistance from you or a caregiver, making sure that they're having that daily oral hygiene. If they have dentures, partials, those should be cleaned every day, um, stored overnight, you know, giving the mouth a chance to rest so that they're not fungal infections and that kind of thing um, beneath those dentures. So that's what I'm thinking of in terms of good home care. And then um, what is your evaluation of water picks? Do they make flossing unnecessary or not needed? I don't think they make that. And um, I'm not sure I could point to a study to this. So I'm gonna, I'm gonna clarify it that way. I think the flossing is needed. That said, I know not everybody can floss, right? So again, it's about meeting people where they are. If you can floss, I would recommend that you floss. Um, if it's challenging, they make floss holders that are a little bit easier um, to use because it's like on a long handle and you don't have to have your hands in your mouth and all that kind of thing. Um, so, you know, there are different, different ways to facilitate that. Um, but 
if you're unable to floss or someone cannot floss for you, you know, it is another way to mechanically remove debris from the mouth and keep it cleaner. So that's a plus, but I wouldn't say unneeded, but again, I'm not sure I can point to a study on that. Um, <clears throat> excuse me. Um, if one has a dry mouth uh, only at night, is that a cause of sleeping with your mouth open or do you think that may be medicated related? Um, it could be um, medicated, medication related, depending on, you know, what time you're taking your medication. So mm -hmm. if there's a, a time of day around it, I would discuss that with the dentist. Um, and again, when they're doing your oral evaluation, um, they'll be looking at your salivary flow and, you know, trying to figure out if you have um, diminished salivary flow. So I would definitely bring that up. It could be an issue of sleeping with your mouth open, but I wouldn't if you're taking a lot of medications or even one that has the potential of dry mouth, I wouldn't overlook that. Um, and then uh, should we brush our teeth after each meal or is that too much? Um, it's not too much. You don't wanna be too um, uh, you know, aggressive, not a, not a scrubbing motion, kind of a gentle, uh, a gentle brushing um, on the, cheek side and on the tongue side of the teeth. I don't think it's it's too much. That's a nice thing to do. If And if you like that, that's great. As long as you're not hearing that it's causing trauma or anything from your dentist. Um, I have a question here. It's uh, it's in regards to uh, training issues and in, in, uh, in, in reference to um, caries. Uh, let's see. Oh, I had caries under the crown that had been a problem. Um, that that weren't diagnosed um, and caused gum inflammation. One dentist said, um, you know, uh, it could be of a leaking crown. Um, several dentists mentioned or investigated this and weren't very proactive, but they, they went ahead and had the crown replaced eventually and um, the inflammation stopped. I guess the question is why, um, you know, why yeah. isn't you know. Hard, hard to say, but what I will say, and we touched on this, um, was the idea of restorations creating a plaque trap. So depending on, you know, what the anatomy of the teeth look like, the crowns, the bridge, there may have been an area where plaque was just tending to get trapped in there or food. So again, I don't know the specific situation, but those are times when I see the gum tissue getting inflamed around a crown. And that that can occur for a number of reasons and it can occur if you're getting recurrent cavity under there right then you're developing a hole essentially in the tooth and that's where um, that's building up um, so there's any number of reasons you know it could occur the other way around too um, yeah um is a perio aid generally used a perio aid you mean the little oh, i'm sorry uh, generally useful um, it can, I assume the little rubber uh, thing, stimulator around the gums. Um, um, again, it's the idea of removing debris that's important. You want to be careful not to be too aggressive with it too, because then you can do some trauma to the, to the gums. And, and then again, also in, in uh, including like feather picks, uh, rubber gum stimulators, suck of brushes. Um, I think you... there are a lot of different um, different types of toothbrushes, um, cleansers that you can use to clean in between the teeth, particularly if you've had gum disease already and you've lost some bone and the spaces are greater. So I think having that discussion with your dentist, maybe showing them what you're interested in using. Um, and then they can guide you into how to use that or suggest something different. So I'm kind of, you know, I support whatever people like to use as long as it's not causing a problem and they're using it correctly. Um, and then if I think that something else might be better, I would suggest that. So I think it's good to, to take in what you're interested in. Um, and then the dentist or the hygienist can give you some feedback on that as well. And do you have any recommendation for a brand of toothpaste? Does it make a difference to use an organic brand? Um, again, I, 
I support what people like to use. I do think it should have a fluoride um, for the reason that many older adults have an increased risk for cavities because they may be on a medication that has a dry mouth because they may have had uh, gum disease already that's exposing surfaces that are prone to cavities that are difficult to clean. So I do think it should have a fluoride. The, the brand, I think, as long as it's something that you're encouraged to use and you will use frequently, I think that's good. Uh, you know, it, is it ideal to um, get like a prescribed fluoride toothpaste? I mean, I, I've actually been prescribed that before and I used it and I, I'm kind of thinking I would like to, you know, when next time I go to get another prescription, but I mean, is it necessary? Again, it depends on what your specific risks are. So if they do that Canberra assessment that we ta talked about, the carries assessment, uh, carries risk assessment, um, they'll determine what your risk is and then tell you if you need a prescription or not. And so there's different kinds of prescriptions. So it could be a toothpaste, it could be a rinse, it could be something that's applied in the office. And um, you may need one at one time because you're on a particular medication or you have some risk. Um, and maybe if that changes over time, then you wouldn't need it again. So just keeping in mind, you know, your routines can be pretty fluid and change over time. And then is there a list of dentists who specialize in uh, geriatric dental care? Would you, do you know if there's uh, somewhere that we could look online to find that information? There isn't a specific, a geriatrics isn't a uh, recognized specialty. So there are some training programs. There are not very many of them, but mm -hmm. there would be dentists who have um, maybe a focus on geriatrics. You know, they've done a lot of continuing education. They have a lot of patients who are older as opposed to maybe having a practice that has a lot of um, kids in it. So if you go to the local dental society, wherever you are, they might be able to direct you to um, patients, who, uh, patients, to providers who might maybe have a certificate in geriatric dentistry, although that's fairly rare, um, or somebody who um, says that they, you know, focus on that kind of care. Prosthodontists also tend to um, have higher numbers of older adults because again, they're managing patients who've lost teeth for a number of reasons. And then what causes a mouth cyst and are you more prone once you have one? Um, I'm, that's kind of a tricky one. I'm not sure exactly what's meant by a mouth cyst. Um, there are different kinds of um, growth that you could have in the mouth. That might, that might be one thing. There are also cysts that you can have in the bone and that's a different thing. So I don't know that I would say you're more prone to having one. It would kind of depend on what the cause is. So that, that's hard for me to answer. I'm not sure I can answer that. Um, I am approaching my 90th birthday, happy birthday, um, yeah. and have been advised by my dentist to have a major uh, attention to clean plaque deposits from the root areas of my teeth. There's been no pain thus far. Is this a usual need at this age? Um, so when plaque and calculus, which is usually the thing that you need to professionally remove from your teeth, the tartar, the calculus, um, you know, deposit on the teeth. And even if they're causing inflammation or bone loss, that's not necessarily a painful process. So again, I would say waiting until something's painful um, is not necessary, particularly if, you know, um, mm -hmm. you've had a diagnosis of something. And again, I don't think that the, the age is necessarily the factor as much as if this is the way to remove those deposits um, reduce the inflammation, hopefully prevent the disease, whatever the, the cause is for remove, removing that calculus at this time from progressing, that would be important to do it. Um, and also if there's no gum disease in the area, really important to remove it um, so that that doesn't develop. And uh, this is our last uh, question. Um, Stannous fluoride versus sodium fluoride. Any thoughts? Um, Stannous, I believe, is a more acidic one. So if you have a dry mouth, that may not be the one to use. So again, it would depend on your specific circumstances. Um, 
yeah, so that would probably be a discussion you'd want to have with the, with the dentist about what kind, and then they would recommend a specific kind to you based on your, your situation. Well, thank you so much for this. Again, that was a, a lot of great information um, to take away from. Uh, and uh, we really appreciate your time uh, being here today. Uh, thank you, everybody, for attending. I will have this recording um, sent out uh, as soon as it's been um, uploaded. And uh, again, thank you, everyone, for joining us. Bye. Thank you for having me. Bye.